Up next, more from our Lectures in History series. This event features University of Virginia professor Gary Gallagher teaching a class on Civil War memory and how people in the North and the South have interpreted the legacy of the conflict from the immediate post-war era to present day. This is about an hour, 15 minutes. All right, here we are for the last class this semester, and we're going to move into the aftermath of the war, as you know. We spent all semester looking at various aspects of this conflict, and right from the beginning, I alerted you that one of the themes in this class was going to be the tension between history and memory. We talked about it on the first day of class, have reiterated it as we've gone along, and so here we are finally at the end where we're going to focus on memory for our last class. There's no better event in United States history to talk about how powerful contending memories of something that happened in the past can be. There's simply nothing remotely equal to it, I think, in the Civil War. Passions get up quickly when people remember the Civil War. I've been watching that in Charlottesville over the last year and a half in the debates over the equestrian statue of R.E. Lee downtown and we can see it. We'll talk, I'll talk at the end uh, when I get to the war today about some of the resonances of the war in our current American situation and the ways in which the different streams of memory put in place by the wartime generation either do or do not remain with us. Now my real focus today is going to be on how the wartime generation remembered the war and I'm going to focus on four great interpretive traditions that came out of the wartime generation, thrived for many decades thereafter, and in differing degrees continue right down uh, to 2017. The loyal white citizenry and African Americans and former Confederates had very different takes on the war as they went forward after Appomattox. They embraced versions of the war that suited their purposes, suited their purposes both in terms of allowing them to come out of the war thinking good about themselves and also suited their purposes as they dealt with various political and social issues that came up in the decades after the war. Their actions remind us that there's almost never one history of an important event. We've talked about that. If there's just a history of the Civil War, you don't need people like me. You would just go buy the Civil War book and read the Civil War book, and then you'd know all about the Civil War, and then if you were interested in something else, you could buy the whatever else book you wanted. But we exist, and there are a bunch of us in this room who are either already doing this for a living or will be doing it for a living. If, if there were only one past, we would be doing something really useful in life instead of what we do, something that contributed uh, to, the, to the common good instead of just sort of adorning it, which is what we mainly do. But the fact that we disagree puts us right in line with what the generation that actually experienced the war did. They had very vibrant, is a sort of soft word, to describe uh, how they contested their versions of history. We're going to start with the winning side. Uh, we'll start with the Union cause and the Emancipation cause, the two winning memories of the war. Uh, then we'll go on to the lost cause, which is the most common term used to get at the former Confederates' memory of the war. Then we'll get to reconciliation, which is, a, is another stream of coming to terms with the war that I think historians have vastly exaggerated. I mean, they've exaggerated the degree to which people said, oh, now we're all Americans, too bad we slaughtered each other, but let's be pals again and we all love one another. Uh, that's sort of comforting, but it's, let's say, not exactly accurate. And then I'll finish with some thoughts about the war today and why people are still interested in the war, what they try to find by going back and examining the war. There are very different reasons for people to look back toward the war, and I'll talk about some of those. But I want to start with the memory of the war that was held by by far the most people who were alive during the conflict, and that is the Union cause memory of the war. I would guess if we were going to parse numbers, and of course we can't do this, but I'll plow ahead. There are 31 million Americans, plus or minus, in 1860. I would say at least 20 million or so of them would have said this is the most important way to remember the war. The Union cause memory of the war is the most important and it is, it gets at the meaning of union that we've talked a lot about in here. I'll say parenthetically, this is of our four great 
traditions here, the one that has been lost almost entirely in modern America is the union cause version of the war. Most Americans, they couldn't begin to tell you what union meant. We've talked about this in the mid-19th century. They're absolutely innocent of that. Uh, and my story about the, the onion uh, in Pasadena reminds us of just how far we are. You know, all for the onion. Uh, someone who would say that now probably doesn't get uh, what was going on in the mid-19th century. Luckily, we all know how important union was, and so we, you can go out and be sort of proselytizers if you want to just remind people uh, that union is the most fraught word in the political vocabulary in the mid-19th century, but the union cause celebrated, above all, the restoration of the republic and the carrying forward of the work of the founding generation. And they would have argued that, yes, we have now defeated the slave-holding oligarchs who pose such a threat to the work of the founding generation. We've gotten rid of slavery. That's not the mo they, they would have been happy that slavery was gone, people who embraced the Union cause, not for the reasons that we would want them to be happy for the most part. They're happy because now these issues related to slavery are not lurking and waiting to burst into the kind of inflammatory language and action that brought on the secession crisis of 1860-61. Get rid of slavery, you get rid of the only internal factor that could sunder the Union. So yes, it's good that emancipation came in the course of the war, but the reason it's a good thing is that it has made the Union safe. And we're going to come out of the war uh, with the Republic intact, small d democracy, Lincoln's notion of the last best hope of Earth, which we've talked about, that is now still firmly in place, whereas it's eroding in Europe, as Americans believed, and they were right in the wake of the failed revolutions of the 1840s. That's what this war did. It has made the Union, made the nation safe. And I'll read just some representative, just three quick quotations that get at this and get at the fact that the other thing celebrated by the Union cause is the Union was saved by whom? By citizen soldiers. By citizen soldiers who put on uniforms and picked up muskets because that's what you do if someone is threatening a political system that gives you a voice in your government and an economic system that affords the opportunity, not the guarantee, but the opportunity to rise. You, we've read Lincoln. You've read Lincoln. Lincoln is absolutely the poster boy for this meaning of union. He gets at both the economic and the we're in control of our own government elements of that. Well, that is what they're celebrating. Here, let's pick someone at random, our friend William Tecumseh Sherman. This is Sherman in his congratulatory order to the men of his armies in May 1865. Three armies came together from distant fields with separate histories, yet bound by one common cause, the union of our country and the perpetuation of the government of our inheritance. Sherman said that the men, <clears throat> quote, had done all men can do. And he added <clears throat> that they could join in the universal joy that fills our land because the war is over and our government stands vindicated before the world. He touches all the key points there, the citizen soldiers saving the government. Roscoe Conkling of New York, who's just a congressman at this part, at this point, he became a very powerful and some whispered corrupt uh, senator after the war. Roscoe Conkling greeted a New York regiment that was on its way home from the war a veteran regiment, and he said that they had <clears throat> come together with a common purpose and hope, quote, peace with the government and the constitution of our fathers established has been the object of the war and the prayer of every patriot and every soldier. And finally, I'll quote one Union soldier here, an Ohio soldier who wrote right after Appomattox. He celebrated, quote, the citizen soldier of the Army of the Republic, by them, the great experiment of self-government has been settled for all people in all countries beneath the sun and liberty and popular institutions everywhere are recognized as an outgrowth of American destiny. This is the, the absolutely purest form of the notion of American exceptionalism that this soldier puts forward. There's no place else like this. There's no, it was worth fighting for. We've salvaged it, and now we're going to go forward. 
Well, they, they, so the loyal citizenry, the loyal white citizenry, we've talked before about how overwhelmingly white the free states were, almost 99%, they would have said, okay, we've done it. We've saved the union. That is good. Now, they followed up on some of the wartime business in the aftermath of the war. We've talked about that a little bit. When former Confederates behaved as if they hadn't lost the war in the summer of 1865, the loyal white citizenry of the United States decided that more was necessary. But it was only in response to what the former Confederates were doing. So you come up with the three great wartime amendments, 13th Amendment in December of 1865, and then the 14th, which sought to guarantee equal legal protection for formerly enslaved people, and then the 15th Amendment, which gave the vote to African-American men. You get those in the aftermath of Appomattox. Republicans, those who believed in the Union cause, used it politically, as you might imagine, and tried to cast Democrats as disloyal, as only lukewarm, if even that, in pursuit of saving the Union. Uh, they talked about how treasonous many of the former uh, or the, the Democrats were, and they engaged in what came to be called waving the bloody shirt, which allegedly had its origins in some Republican speaker, literally waving a shirt stained with the blood of a Union soldier. But I'll quote a politician from J uh, named James G. Blaine, who was one of the great uh, Republicans of the post-war years. He was from Maine, another person who may not have always been exactly on the straight and narrow. He urged in 1876 northern veterans to, quote, vote as you shot during the war. In other words, vote for the Republicans against the Democrats and the former rebel fiends uh, who were in the Democratic Party in the South. And this is how he put it with his very light touch. Every prison guard who tortured Union prisoners at Andersonville was a Democrat. The man who shot Abraham Lincoln was a Democrat. Every man who tried to tear the old flag from the heaven it enriches was a Democrat. Every man who has tried to destroy the nation was a Democrat. Soldiers, every scar you have on your heroic bodies was given you by a Democrat. Now, this is sort of indirect, but if we really pay attention, we can figure out the message here. The message is, vote Republican. The Republicans saved the Union. And we can also see what is not mentioned here in this catalog of things. There's no mention of emancipation. There's no mention of getting rid of slavery. It's a mention of saving the nation. Well, they were very effective at waving the bloody shirt. They were very effective at running soldiers who put on Union uniforms for president. Not only the man, we get U.S. Grant twice, of course, 1868 and 1872. <clears throat> but then we also get Rutherford B. Hayes, and we get James A. Garfield, and we get Benjamin Harrison, all Union generals who were elected president. And the last gasp of electing Union veterans came with William McKinley, who was a company grade officer, but nonetheless a Union veteran. So every Republican who held the presidency for the rest of the 19th century had been directly involved in saving the Union. Uh, the Democrats, we know who they ran successfully twice, Grover Cleveland, who hired the poor Polish guy to go fight for him. So there's kind of a disjuncture between who's getting elected as a Republican to the presidency and who's getting elected as a Democrat to the presidency. And the Republicans would say, of course the Democrats are running a draft dodger. Uh, we run generals, they run draft dodgers. The, the Democrats did run one former general for president. They ran Winfield Scott Hancock in 1880. And he did okay, but he did not win. It is a plus to have Union veteran on your resume if you're running for office. Uh, after the Civil War, and the Democrats struggle with this notion that they were not really fully on board with this struggle to save the Union. They came back, though, once the former Confederate states were back. The Democrats regained control of the House of Representatives in 1874. It didn't even take a decade for the Democrats to reestablish control of the House of Representatives. But the Republicans used the Union cause very very effectively. They also, the loyal citizenry, did a number of things to commemorate the Union cause. They established what they called Decoration Day, what we call Memorial Day now, which was a day specifically to go and remember the Union men who had given their lives 
to save the nation. You would go and decorate the graves, hence Decoration Day, put a flag, hear a speech related to the war, watch some veterans parade uh, in their uniforms during Decoration Day. The, the government, as we've talked about, established national cemeteries specifically because they needed a place to put more than a third of a million dead United States soldiers. Only United States soldiers, no Confederate soldiers, at least not deliberately, in these cemeteries. There are a handful of exceptions to that, but not many. And so you would go off and you would combine those two things, a Decoration Day ceremony in a national cemetery. So you're not just talking about the men who gave their lives for the Union. You're surrounded by them as you hear a speech about the value of union. They erected memorials and monuments in courthouse squares. Uh, the most magnificent one of all <clears throat> is in Indianapolis. It's an incredible monument uh, right downtown. If you're headed to a Colts game, you're not that far from it. You can go touch base with the union boys and then go watch the Colts. Uh, wish they had a line who could defend uh, the best quarterback in the NFL. But that's another story. I won't talk about that. They put these monuments up everywhere from very modest ones in villages and small towns to really grand monuments. You can't walk around Washington, D.C. without running into Union generals on horses. They're everywhere. There's even one of George Brinton McClellan uh, in Washington, D.C. But the grandest of all is of Grant right in front of the Capitol, of course, looking straight down the mall toward the Lincoln Memorial. So you have national cemeteries, you have Memorial Day. And if you read the inscriptions on the monuments, they're very important. We still don't have a good book. This is something that some bright graduate student should take on sometime. A really serious look at the inscriptions on Civil War memorials, both Union and Confederate. The dominant motifs on the Union ones, on the Northern ones, on the ones in the loyal states are Union, 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 Nation, and on some, but a really small uh, percentage of all of them, you also will get some mention of emancipation, often in terms of Lincoln's, they'll mention Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation together with Union when you look at them. The memorial landscape underscores powerfully the fact that Union was the dominant memory of the war among the loyal citizenry of the United States. So they also wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. Uh, the Civil War generation picked up pens and just outpoured the accounts, uh, regimental histories, memoirs, published sets of letters, and so forth. And when you read those, you also get a really strong sense of just how dominant this notion of a war for union was. It's a war for union, and it's a war that ended with this grand success that ratified the work of the founders and actually gave this generation work. I mean, how do you compete with the founders? That's one of the problems. Well, all they did was establish the country in a bloody war against scummy Great Britain, and then they are responsible for the Constitution. Okay, check, check. And what have we done lately? Uh, how do you compete with that memory? That's tough. Hey, how about saving the work of the founding generation? That's not bad. Let's put that on our resume. And that makes us look pretty good. And then that doesn't leave anything for later generations to do, but who cares? We're taking care of it, sort of a baby boomer approach to life. I don't care about you, what about me? Uh, I'm more important, I want you, and I mean all of you, to take care of me uh, as I get old. And my generation lives forever. We are gonna be around, you are gonna have us as a giant anvil on your backs for almost all of your lives. And you just can't do anything about us. So don't even try. <laughs> you don't have a chance. Well, here this gives, this gives the Civil War generation something that they can, they can stand. They often created uh, images of Washington, Lincoln, and Grant together, put them literally side by side. I've talked before about how at the end of the war, I mean, Lincoln is the great figure for us. Now, at the end of the Civil War, Grant, and Lincoln were equivalent figures. And they would put those together, tying the work of the revolutionary generation to the work of the generation that saved the Union, very overtly tying them together. So the Union caused memory, hugely important, one of the winning memories of the war. 
The other winning memory of the war, of course, was the emancipation cause. This would have been embraced by the overwhelming majority of African Americans in the United States, both formerly enslaved and the small minority that lived in the free states. This would have been their principal understanding of the war, along with white abolitionists. I think many radical Republicans would have said the same thing. They would have said, yes, of course it's a good thing that the Union was preserved. If the Union hadn't been preserved, of course, slavery would have lived. The Union is the, if you don't save the Union, you don't get rid of slavery. So yes, it's a good thing the Union was preserved. But it was only worth preserving if it's an improved version of the Union. And what is that improvement? It has to be a Union without slavery. It's a Union without the institution of slavery mocking that high language of the Declaration of Independence and other foundational documents. So yes, the unions being saved is good, but the most important thing that came out of the war is the destruction of what Frederick called the hell black system of slavery. Yes? Um, did people like the abolitionists think that they were still like promoting the work of the founding fathers? Did, did people like the abolitionists think they were promoting the work of the Founding Fathers? They thought they were improving the work of the Founding Fathers, and they thought the Founding Fathers' work, let's take a random uh, thing, at, uh, how about the Constitution? The Constitution is fine, but it has a, a, a profound flaw at its center. It accepts slavery. So many abolitionists before the war, for example, they'd call the Constitution a rag. It's a rag that allows slavery to exist in the United States. So the founders were on to some things, but their work was far from perfect. It will only, will really only realize the purpose of the founders if we get rid of slavery. That would have been their attitude toward that. So the, there is one reason that many people in the antebellum years didn't like abolitionists at all, saw them as radicals who were a problem, is because many abolitionists would in fact attack the Constitution. And that was just considered anathema by most American citizens, U.S. citizens, in the late 19th century. Did you have your hand up? No. <laughs> so the emancipation cause is also a winner's cause. I would say maybe five, if we're going to put a number on this. And again, we can't put a number on it, but I'm putting a number on it. I'd say about five million people would have said this was the most important thing. And African Americans and others established their own traditions in remembering the war. They had their own day, one day that they would pick during the year. And they often called it Emancipation Day. And it was on different days in different states. In Texas, it's called Juneteenth, uh, which relates to the middle of June 1865 when word of emancipation came to some places in, in Texas. But other days here in Virginia, it was often April 9th, Appomattox Day, because among the troops that got in front of Lee's army at Appomattox on the 9th of April were USCT units that were in the forefront of the army that was pursuing paralleling Lee's army as it went west. In Virginia, April 9th often became a, the, 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 the one day of the year where you would have your major celebration in the black community. And you'd have parades, you'd have speeches, you'd have the same kind of things that you would have with the mainstream of decoration slash Memorial Day celebrations in the United States. Uh, but you would have them on different days and you would have them with a specific focus on this outcome of the war, the end of slavery. Now for African American veterans, that on their resume was just as useful as it was for white veterans who ran for office or whatever, but it, in numbers disproportionate to how many of them there were, USCT veterans were very prominent in black communities after the war. They had disproportionate influence. It was a tremendous cachet to say, I was a USCT man. Yes, I didn't just, I did the most direct thing you could do to get rid of, so what's the most direct thing you can do to get rid of slavery? Put on a uniform, pick up a musket, and go try to vanquish the rebels and destroy the Confederacy. There was not a widespread uh, movement to erect monuments to USCT men. In fact, there was almost none. The, the memorial landscape, almost devoid of monuments specifically directed at the emancipation memory of the war. The earliest monument that went up that dealt with the ending of slavery, really, is Ball's 
famous uh, uh, statue in Emancipation Park, Thomas Ball's statue in Emancipation Park on Capitol Hill, which went up in 1876, which later became controversial because it's just, it's some, I know many of you have seen it, it's, it's Lincoln standing up and kind of reaching down and a black man sort of starting to rise. It, it conveys the message, Lincoln freed the slaves, Lincoln struck the shackles from black people. Uh, it's the first notable monument that went up to deal with emancipation. It's still there, and if you haven't seen it, you should go look at it. Uh, Frederick Douglass gave a speech there in which he criticized that view of why emancipation came. But that's 1876. The next major monument that went up was 1897, and that is the, uh, it's my favorite Civil War monument uh, of all. It's Augustus St. Gaudens' monument. Uh, in Boston to the 54th Massachusetts and Robert Gould Shaw. It's an amazing monument, but it is to Shaw and to the 54th. There's a, as only academics can do, uh, there was an article a few years ago where uh, someone attacked the St. Gaudens monument because they said it diminished the black soldiers because they were on the ground and Shaw was on a horse. Uh, they apparently were innocent of the fact that colonels are on horses and infantrymen are often on the ground, whether they're white or black. The main place to find an infantryman is on the ground because that's why they're infantrymen. They're walking along. It's a, it's a spectacular monument, spectacular. And the National Gallery in Washington has a, has a beautiful plaster of it. If you haven't, you don't have to go all the way to Boston to see it. Go to the National Gallery, stand in front of that monument, and then come and tell me that it demeans African-American soldiers. It really, it, I could, as I've said in here before, only an academic uh, could argue that that somehow diminishes the service of these men. It's an amazing monument, 1897. Yes? Uh, did the traditions of Shaw's family influence why he, his regiment was the one that cut the monument? Yes, did, did, Shaw's, did the prominence of Shaw's family have anything to do with why he's this? Of course it did, yes. Absent Shaw, would that monument to the 54th have gone up? Almost certainly no, it would not have. So it's Shaw is, is a key there. Uh, a very well-connected family and, uh, and an abolitionist family. His parents more abolitionist than Robert Gould Shaw. Robert Gould Shaw was anti-slavery, as we've talked about, but not really burning with the abolitionist spirit uh, the way uh, that his parents were. But yes, that's a, that's a huge, that, that is a huge element in that. When we went to Petersburg and we were down uh, where they have the, the rebuilt earthworks, we saw the little monument there that went up in 1990 to the USCT troops. That was, I mean, it went up in 1990, so now I'll state the stunningly obvious. That wasn't there uh, until the wake of glory. This is, I think, one of the influences of a successful uh, part of popular culture in carrying over into how we remember things. We've, I've, I made you write about movies in here because movies really do have an impact on how people remember the past. That monument, I believe, would not be there if it weren't for Glory. Glory really put USCT men on that. But that's 19, that, that, that is almost a century after St. Gaudens' monument in Boston. It wasn't until the very end of the 20th century 1998, that you got a kind of national monument to the USCT men. And it's in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's at Vermont and 10th Street in the Shaw District of Washington. And it is a, it's a plaza that has the names of the 200,000 black men who served in the Army and the Navy on tablets that go around this little plaza, and then there's a sculpture in the middle. But that is, that's 1998 when that went up. So the emancipation memory of the war, it's there, and it carries forward, but it isn't, it wouldn't be as prominent to someone who's just kind of looking at the memorial landscape to figure out what the memory of the war was. Frederick Douglass figured this out very early on. He, he, uh, he watched what was happening after the war and he believed that the emancipation memory of the war was slipping away as early as the 1870s. And he devoted a good bit of his uh, later years to trying to keep alive the emancipation memory 
of the war. As early as the, that Robert E. Lee died in 1870, in October of 1870, and Frederick Douglass read the obituaries of Robert E. Lee, and it seemed to him that the loyal citizenry had already forgotten that there was a right side and a wrong side to the war. The Union cause certainly believed there was a right side and a wrong side. The Union cause is the right side. The rebels were traitors, and that's why we call it the War of the Rebellion. And so there's a right side and a wrong side there. There's a right side and a wrong side here. But Douglas thought that a sense of that was slipping away, especially in Democratic newspapers in the North, which had really quite... Uh, gentle, even appreciative obituaries. He wrote <clears throat> uh, after Lee's death uh, that he was sick and tired of the, quote, bombastic laudation of the rebel chief. We can scarcely take up a newspaper that is not filled with nauseating flatteries of the late Robert E. Lee. That is Douglas in 1870, uh, already looking down the road and anticipating that maybe the emancipation part of this equation was going to be eroding uh, much more quickly than it should. Those who would have been happy to see the emancipation memory of the war erode uh, put in place the third uh, of our traditions here, and that is what's come to be called the lost cause tradition. This would have been former Confederates uh, who did this, and let's say maybe Five and a half million of them will give, we'll, let's deduct 10% for unionists, actual unionists, uh, among white uh, people in the Confederacy. But then let's add Kentuckians and others who discovered they were Confederates retrospectively, as we've talked about. Kentucky woke up after, after, after Appomattox, suffered from a kind of amnesia about what had happened the four years before. They all became Kentucky colonels after the war. And put up a huge monument to Jefferson Davis. Go compare the monuments in Kentucky to Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. Both those buckaroos were born there, as we know. But compare the two monuments to them. I wonder which one's taller. <laughs> and the one that's taller, I'm going to give it away, is not Abraham Lincoln's. Uh, so let's say five and a half million people would have embraced the lost cause memory of the war uh, very quickly. Now, the white South has a much greater problem in some ways after the war than the loyal citizenry did. They are big time losers, overwhelming losers. They have lost shatteringly, not kind of, not maybe, not gosh, I wonder really who won and lost. No, they're very well aware of who lost. They, as we've talked about, lost a far higher, I mean, it's, you can calculate the difference in loss. A far higher percentage of their military age young men are dead, far higher uh, than in the United States. They, and we, can't, uh, we cannot recapture how important this was, their slaveholding social structure is swept away. We, and this is, I, don't, there's, I can't think of anything equivalent in our society that you could change that would bring as much of an impact. And I'm going to quote one person on this. He was married to one of Thomas Jefferson's granddaughters. Uh, he lived at Edge Hill uh, out near Keswick for a while. He went to UVA, graduated from UVA in 1853. His name is Robert Garlic Hill Kane. Uh, he married <coughs> Jane Randolph, and he is his, her uncle was George With Randolph. Never mind, we won't wallow in genealogy here. Kane worked for the for the Confederate government, and right after the war, he was traveling through Virginia. He kept a diary. And this is what he wrote shortly after Appomattox. The abolition of slavery immediately and by a military order is the most marked feature of this conquest of the South. Conquest of the South. Manumission after this fashion will be regarded hereafter, wrote Cain with scarcely controlled anger, when it has borne its fruits and the passions of the hour have passed away as the greatest social crime ever committed on earth. I think he's upset uh, about emancipation. The greatest social crime ever committed on earth. Other than that, I'm not upset about it. Uh, but I am pretty upset about it. So you have former Confederates surveying both the physical and the social landscape after the war, and they are going to have to deal with a profound
failure. No other part of white American society has ever had to grapple with this. And so how, okay, so what do you do if that's what you're dealing with? How do you find a way to hold your head up and say, yes, we kind of did support secession, we th and, and yes, here's where we are now. How do we find something positive to take out of that experience? How do you do it? And what they did with their economy in ruins in the short term, the economy came back, of course, uh, in many ways. Uh, they had some troops occupying them. That's been vastly overstated, too. There's never a real army of occupation in the, in the former Confederate states. There just isn't. The U.S. Army gets tiny very quickly. Much of it's deployed uh, out west, as it always was. Uh, and a, a true army of occupation would have had, you had a million men in United States uniform in May 1865, and even those million men were only occupying a very small part of the Confederacy. The U.S. Army is back down to about 30,000 men by the early 1870s. 30,000. We've talked about this before. The French Army, more than a half a million at that point. The Prussian Army, more than half a million. I mean, the U.S. Army's tiny. It's part of the United States tradition of not liking standing armies in the peacetime. You don't need a, and the fact that most people in the loyal states didn't think there was a lot left to do. Never mind that. That's a subject for another class, another place. The point is, Confederates are looking around. They realize how many of their young men are dead. They realize that their social structure is gone. And they don't know that Jim Crow is coming, incidentally. So they can't just sit down and say, yeah, slavery's gone, but Jim Crow's on the way, so everything's going to be OK. They didn't know that yet. Part of what they're doing in the next years, I mean, Jim Crow is the most obvious expression of Confederate response to the loss of slavery and defeat. But they don't know that's coming yet. How are they going to make sense of what's happened to them? And the people who might look at them and say, really, secession was a good idea? Really? And look at us now? How do they do it? Here's how they do it. They don't have a retreat uh, where they all go to a cabin somewhere in the Appalachians and say, let's come up with a rationale for the war. That's not how it happens. It, it emerges organically, uh, an overused word, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the war. In fact, you can find the seeds of it in the war itself. But they come up with an interpretation of the war that allows them to maintain a sense of honor uh, in the wake of this awful defeat. And we have come to call it the lost cause interpretation. Here are its main elements. I mean, there are variations of it, but there are a few cardinal elements. Number one, they are not idiots. They realized they were out of step with Western civilization even before the war because they were a slave-holding society. They understood they needed to distance themselves from slavery. And so they argued that the war wasn't re-secession, was not really about slavery. It was really about constitutional principle. It was really about, do you want an intrusive central government ramming things down your throat, or do you want the states to maintain their integrity and sovereignty? As the founders said, was their argument. We've talked about this in the course of the semester, and you've read Jefferson Davis. They tried to inoculate themselves uh, against the charge that they're simply doing all this to protect their slaveholding society. They understand they're going to be judged before the bar of history, and they know that if they are as honest retrospectively as they were going forward about slavery, they would look bad. We have that. We've talked about this. We've talked about Alexander Stevens' cornerstone speech before the war, and we've talked about Jefferson Davis before. They say slavery's right at the middle of it. Retrospectively, they change their minds, uh, as we know. And they say that not only is it not at the center of things, uh, <clears throat> it's really only incidental. That's the word that Jefferson Davis used. It was incidental to this struggle for high constitutional principle. Get yourself free of the taint of slavery. That's number one. Number two. Why did the war end the way it is? Because we never had a chance. Because of overwhelming Union manpower and material resources, there is no loss of honor in losing a war for high constitutional principle that you never could have won. It was a gallant fight for the right reasons, but we never could have won because there were so many Yankees and they had so much stuff. Uh, to fight us with. You know the Yankees, that Grant, that Grant, 
Grant wasn't a good general. He could just count on some level. He did go to West Point. He didn't learn much there, but he learned arithmetic. And he knew that he's got unlimited men and poor Lee. We know this. We know this. Lee only has 11 men at Petersburg at the end, and, and they've only got nine shoes among them, and six of them are left shoes. So it's, the situation is terrible, and Grant has a million men, and yet it takes Grant nine months to subdue R. E. Lee. Now, who is the greater general there? Is it Mr. Arithmetic, or is it R. E. Lee? It's not even close. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Go down to the university cemetery here in Seaville and walk in the entrance and there's a Confederate monument there. First one that went up in Charlottesville, went up in 1893. Read the inscription on the front of it. Fate denied them victory. Fate! I'm going to tell you this right now. If you ever get in a contest where you know fate is against you, just throw in the towel right then. Because if fate is against you, you are not going to emerge triumphant. <laughs> that is a perfect lost cause message on the front of that monument in the UVA cemetery where there are a thousand Confederate soldiers buried who died in the hospitals at UVA and later Charlottesville during the war. So... It's not about slavery. We never could have won. There's an alternative explanation for Confederate defeat as well, which is utterly irreconcilable with we never could have won. It's we almost won, but James Longstreet undid Lee at Gettysburg. If we'd won Gettysburg, we would have won. One reason people think Gettysburg was so important now is because Confederates just, they, they couldn't talk enough about it and argue enough about it after the war. And Longstreet, that perfidious Republican, Catholic, Grant-liking, Lee-hating guy. Uh, he undid, and Jeb Stewart did too, and so did Ewell, and so did everybody, and they all did it, and so it's their fault. And we never could have won. Well, either you never could have won, or you take it. You get one chance to get this right. You can't have it both ways. That's an aside. The main thing is we never could have won. Northern manpower and resources. And I'm going to read you a wonderful quotation that gets at this. Uh, from one of my favorite lost cause buckaroos, and that's Jubal Early. We haven't talked a lot about Jubal Early in here. He's really important in the lost cause, in the development of the lost cause argument. Uh, and here is how he put it, this getting this sense of kind of flesh and blood, band of brothers, Confederates, contesting this mechanistic uh, juggernaut from the United States. He put it this way. General Lee had, this is after, this is why Lee lost. General Lee had not been conquered in battle, but surrendered because he no longer had an army with which to give battle. I think at that sort of because he was conquered, but never mind that. <laughs> what he surrendered, what he surrendered was the skeleton, the mere ghost of the Army of Northern Virginia, which had been gradually worn down here's where you really pay attention, by the combined agencies of numbers, steam power, railroads, mechanism, and all the resources of physical science. All that stuff is on the Yankee side, all that physical <coughs> science stuff, but that's important. All the Confederates, as I said, have is not enough shoes and blood and sinew, and this pressure from the Yankee hordes under Grant Hissing is advisable now. Finally produced that exhaustion of our army and resources and that accumulation of numbers on the other side, which wrought the final disaster. Jubal Early, I mean, it's numbers, dude. Can you understand that? There's nothing else going on here. And he says, shall I compare Grant to Lee? He said, you might as well compare the pyramids in their majesty beside the Nile to a pygmy perched on Atlas. And we know which was which in Jubal Early's mind. They also are aware, they are very self-consciously looking toward the future. These, they understand how historians and future Americans are going to understand the war. They're going to read what the wartime generation wrote. That is where people are going to turn to reach their conclusions about the war. 
and they talked to each other in the immediate aftermath of the war. Lee had already kind of paved the way about the numbers argument, and, and, I, and I need to say, you, we already know this, there's an element of truth in the numbers argument. The Union does have more. It has four times as many white men in its military age population. We know that. Its industrial capacity is far beyond that of the Confederacy. They're not making that part of it up. That part of it is true. But they exaggerated and they miss Confederate advantages and so forth. But they know they're writing for the future. Lee thought for a while about writing a history of his army after the war. He got down to Lexington and he even began to collect information about it. He wrote to former officers and said, you know, my records are incomplete. Do you have something on this? Do you have something on that? And he and Early corresponded with one another. And this is how Lee explained what he was up to. He wrote this in November of 1865. He said, my only object is to transmit, if possible, the truth to posterity and do justice to our brave soldiers. And then he added, we shall have to be patient and suffer for a while at least. At present, the public mind is not prepared to receive the truth. Well, his truth is that the U.S. overwhelmed the United States. In his order at Appomattox, his famous order, to, his farewell order to the soldiers, which he didn't write, but he approved of it, and, and someone he really trusted wrote it, he said that they had been compelled to give in to overwhelming numbers and resources. That's how, that's the phrase that Lee used at Appomattox. So the, uh, this, this uh, union numbers thing is, starts very early. Jubal Early replied to Lee, again on this point of getting the record down so that people will read it in the future. Uh, he said that, he said, yes, you should write this history of the Army in Northern Virginia. You need to do this, General Lee. Lee didn't in the end because he got busy running Washington College. Uh, as president. And it's, I think it's a good thing he didn't write it because he couldn't write worth a damn. Uh, he wrote one thing we have and it's the most wooden. He was absolutely, he probably had I love passive voice tattooed on one of his biceps because he really never broke free of passive voice. Uh, never. Okay, that's another aside. Here is what Early uh, wrote to Lee. He said, the most that is left to us is the history of our struggle. And I think that ought to be accurately written. We lost nearly everything but honor, and that should be religiously guarded. So here is, we've got to get our version down, former Confederates are telling one another. We have to do it. We have to get it both for our own people, our children and others, so we can look them in the eye. But we know that we're going to be judged going forward by people who are going to look at things that the wartime generation wrote. So they are busy doing this and saying it wasn't about slavery. And they never could have won. And then they play their best card. Do they say, what person can we talk about? I know, let's talk about Jefferson Davis. Everyone loves him. No, of course they do. Because almost no one loves Jefferson Davis. He's not lovable, uh, as you know from reading his works. Who can you talk about? Who's the most important Confederate during the war? Well, it's R.E. Lee. Isn't even close. You can talk about him without talking about slavery. You can even pretend he's sort of anti-slavery. If you squint just right and stand on your head and turn the lights out, uh, <laughs> you, you know from becoming Confederates that part of it. I won't belabor that. You can talk about Lee. He is your best card. He was a brilliant general. He did win great battles against long odds. Joe Hooker did have twice as many men, literally, at Chancellorsville as Lee had. And yet Lee won with, with his cohort paladin, Thomas Jonathan Jackson struck down at high tide, tragically, if only, all the ifs that linger. What if, what if Stonewall Jackson, and then you lower your voice, had been at Gettysburg? What if he had? <laughs> what if he had? Well, we know what, right? He would have been in a box, <laughs> moldering and would have had no impact on Chancellorsville, and it would have seemed awkward to carry his corpse up into Pennsylvania, uh, <laughs> even to rally the troops. Look, there's Jackson in a wooden box, uh, rally behind the Virginians. Uh, that really wouldn't work that way. So you focus on Lee, focus on Lee, and present him as a Christian gentleman, which he was, Protect, pr project him as someone who is the anti-McClellan. There's not a single letter in Lee's vast correspondence 
that is like almost any letter that McClellan wrote to Ellen Marcy McClellan. The, the kinds of letters that say, I'm wonderful, if only, if only they would let me have my way, uh, Lincoln's an idiot, everybody else is an idiot, I'm the hero, I want to save the republic, I'm, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. There aren't letters like that from Lee. So you can, he does, he's the perfect person to seize on. And so they do, they emphasize Lee. Lee is their man. And there are more monuments to Lee that go up. The one in Charlottesville is one of the last ones. It went up in 1924. But there are more monuments to Lee than to anyone else in the Confederacy, by far. By far. And as we'll see in a minute, he even crossed over the divide from just being a lost cause figure to being an American figure. He became, and when I was growing up, the two great figures from the Civil War were Lincoln and Lee. Lincoln and Lee. Not Lincoln and Grant. Why wasn't it Lincoln and Grant? Or, anyway, never mind Davis. Davis was never in the running. He had no chance to become one of those people. So the Confederates settle on these things, and then they establish their own traditions. They have their own Decoration Day, and it is still, it is still celebrated in some places. I think Fredericksburg still does. I'm looking at Peter Carmichael. I think it does. Uh, they have their own dec they, they have their own national cemeteries, although there is no nation to create the cemeteries. Groups of women across the South, a former UVA student who's now a very successful professor at Purdue named Caroline Janey, uh, wrote a book on what were called ladies' memorial associations, which constituted themselves after the war and oversaw the disinterment of Confederate dead from battlefields and their reinterment in what can only be called Confederate national cemeteries. They're, they're parts of larger cemeteries. Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond has a Confederate section. They bury them by state. They would have speeches there just as the Union cause people would have speeches in national cemeteries. You would have the Confederate Decoration Day, Confederate Memorial Day, just as you had the National Memorial Day, Decoration Day, and monuments went up all over the former Confederacy. There are, there are five of them in Charlottesville. And the war didn't ever come here directly. You have the one in the cemetery. You have the, a Confederate soldier in front of the Albemarle County Courthouse downtown. You have equestrian statues of Jackson and Lee. And you have the tablets on the front of the rotunda that list the 500 UVA graduates who died in the Confederate Army. Uh, and that happened all over the Confederacy. Little towns have Confederate monuments, usually in front of the courthouse, but not always. It's the same phenomenon as you had in the North, and usually the inscriptions on them get at the idea of overwhelming odds, of fighting for high constitutional principle, often specifically state rights against an encroaching federal government. Go read the one in front of uh, Albemarle County Courthouse. You get state rights, you get, so it's a kind of dueling memorial landscape in many ways that you get after the war, and the lost cause puts up many, many, many monuments. They also wrote, just as people who embraced the Union cause or those who embraced the Emancipation cause. One of the great examples of Emancipation cause writing uh, was a thick three-volume study uh, by a uh, senator named Henry Wilson, who was from Massachusetts, who wrote on the rise and fall of the slave power, uh, which the third volume of which deals uh, with the war. But the Confederates do a lot of writing and they prove quite successful at getting their version of the war into print and into popular culture. And we've talked in here a good bit about films. The two most seen films that deal with the Civil War, and by far the two most important, by far, are Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind in terms of how many people saw them, how long they were part of the cultural landscape, and they both have very strong, they're not pure lost cause, uh, but uh, there's no emancipation cause in them, no real union cause. There's a little reconciliation, touches of it, especially in Birth of a Nation, but they're pretty much lost cause. Over, you know, Yang Sherman is the great destroyer and the great invader in these two. They come in, giant Yankee armies wreaking havoc, uh, destroying everything. Uh, they also have the, the motif, which is the last element of the Lost Cause I'll talk about, which is this, of a loyal enslaved population. That's another key part of the Lost Cause. The slaves were happy. The slaves were content. The slaves were well treated. 
under the Confederacy. And in fact, the Yankees didn't like black people as much as Confederates do. That, that kind of reaches its apex in the film Gods and Generals, to me, where you have a, which is 2003, it's a lost cause film in many ways, and you have a conversation between Stonewall Jackson and his black cook. And Jackson's interviewing him, it turns out they're both from Lexington. And, and the words that come out of the black character's mouth are quite remarkable. You know, I, well, you know, we're kind of all in this together, uh, aren't we? And yeah, we're looking toward a, and you watch it and you think, what does the prospective cook thinks in it, think is in it for him if the Confederacy wins? Really, it just kind of makes your mind drift away to something else that might make sense. And a book, my favorite book title of all books on the Civil War is Stonewall Jackson, colon, the black man's friend. <laughs> I'm not making that up. I'm not making that up. That's an actual book title. And you can tie that ties directly to these scenes in Gods in general. You know, if only the Confederacy can win, at last black people will get a break. I mean, that's kind of the message here. Uh, as I've said often in here, you can't make some things up. You just can't. The bitterness that remained among former Confederates was profound. Profound. And I'm just going to quote all of the reconciliation stuff. Here is something that gets at what former Confederates actually thought. This is part of the lyrics from a song called, Oh, I'm a Good Old Rebel. Oh, I'm a Good Old Rebel. Uh, which was sarcastically dedicated to the Honorable Thaddeus Stevens. So you know uh, what's going on here. 300,000 Yankees is stiff in southern dust. We got 300,000 before they conquered us. They died of southern fever and southern steel and shot. I wish they was three million instead of what we got. I can't take up my musket and fight them now no more, but I ain't going to love them. That is certain sure. And I don't want no pardon for what I was and am. I won't be reconstructed, and I don't give a damn. <laughs> Welcome back to the United States. That's right. We're all Americans, and it was just a little spat, uh, and I'm not really upset. I love the lyrics to that when everybody tells me how easily they got back together. Let's talk about reconciliation quickly. This is a powerful part of the literature. Uh, the idea that white Americans, North and South, just decided not to talk about slavery, don't talk about race, don't talk about who was right and wrong, just get together and in sort of a, a, a sort of burst of uh, racist energy, agree that everybody was gallant and we love each other. There is, there's absolutely some truth to this, and there you can, you can find evidences of this, but I think you need to be careful about exactly how you explore this. I think there was a public face for some people and a private face for some. Lee's a perfect example. His public face is, don't look back, look forward. They won, accept what they tell us to do, and get on with life. That's his public face, and he never deviated from it. His private face, he seethed about Reconstruction. He hated what was going on in terms of racial accommodation. He was very upset. That's the private Lee, not the public Lee. Uh, the same was true with many other figures. But there was a movement toward reconciliation uh, in, in some ways where they're talking about a common, common heritage. We are all Americans. But I think it's been overdone, but still very important to look at. In films, this is a strong element in many films uh, that have come down uh, over, uh, over the years. There's a good bit of that. Those of you who watched the film Gettysburg, the reconciliation theme there is really teased out by Hancock and Armstead, old Winnie boy. You know, they're really only thinking about each other and all they care about is each other. They were in the army together. They loved being in the army together. And now they're, alas, fighting each other. And there's, they really are just Americans. And it's too bad that this is going on. Uh, that's a very strong uh, re reconciliation theme. The, the war with Spain gave a wonderful opportunity for a kind of public reconciliation. And so the United States government, for example, I mean, they need soldiers from both former Confederate states and former loyal states in the war with Spain. And so they pitch it that way and make a big deal out of the fact you have Southern white boys and Northern white boys all in blue uniforms going off to fight the Spaniards 
in Cuba uh, and elsewhere. And they even trotted out a group of former Confederate generals and made them generals in the United States Army. Joseph Wheeler was one of them. There's film of little Joe Wheeler, who was about this tall, uh, walking back and forth with a giant sword and a long white beard. But Fitzhugh Lee, Lee's nephew, uh, was another one who was made a general. Our Rugby Road in Charlottesville is named after the house where Thomas Lafayette Rosser lived. Rosser's a former Confederate Major General who was brought back as a general during the war with Spain as well. So this is a very self-conscious effort to push reconciliation. Here are all these boys fighting together in blue uniforms against a common foe. Against a common foe. And the newspapers loved an alleged quotation from Joseph Wheeler down in Cuba as his troops were attacking and he got caught up in the moment and he said, that's it boys, go get those damn Yankees. And someone said, General, they're Spaniards. That's what I meant. <laughs> go get the damn Spaniards, not the damn Yankees. Oh, isn't that, that's just, I mean, really. That Joe Wheeler, uh, he's such a caution uh, and he's really just an American now. Just an American, just an American. The reconciliation cause took a number of forms, and, and we can see it on the memorial landscape. And you're, I'm finally going to come to your handouts here. The top thing on your handout is a United States half dollar minute in 1925 that has Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson on it. Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson on a United States 50 cent piece. Just think about that a minute. I wonder how many losing rebels in civil wars in history ended up on official coinage from the Republic. They almost undid. Turn to the next page there. You have this great cartoon from 1938, which is the 75th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And it says, I don't need to, I mean, let's pretend I have PowerPoint now, and so I'm repeating the stunningly obvious as if you can't figure anything out on your own. It's a Union and a Confederate veteran, ancient veterans, and there they are, shoulder to shoulder. Was Gettysburg necessary? Really, was Gettysburg necessary? It almost makes you think about recent quotations about whether the Civil War was necessary. But anyway, <laughs> was Gettysburg necessary? Was it necessary? And the implication, of course, is it wasn't necessary. Our family had a spat. Oh, too bad, too bad, too bad. And I'm going to give you two perfect examples of reconciliationist rhetoric that do airbrush emancipation out of the picture, don't talk about who was right and wrong, and they took, both took place at Gettysburg, one on the 50th anniversary of the battle, one on the 75th, and they were delivered by two people who, let's just say they're not quite picked at random, Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. They're the ones, and it seems like the same speechwriter wrote the same speeches, but here we have Wilson. We found one another again as brothers and comrades in arms, enemies no longer, generous friends, rather, our battles long past, the quarrel forgotten, except that we shall not forget the splendid valor, the manly devotion of the men then arrayed against one another, now grasping hands and smiling into each other's eyes. Just a kind of collective American manhood that had fought for causes. We won't talk about what the causes were and whether one was right or wrong. Just these are American virtues of gallantry, devotion to cause, and heroism. They're American virtues, not Northern virtues, not Southern virtues, American virtues. 25 years later, Franklin Roosevelt, quote, men who wore the blue and men who wore the gray are brought here by the memories of old divided loyalties, but they meet here in united loyalty to a united cause which the unfolding years have made it easier to see. Of the veterans present, said Roosevelt, and behind him he was dedicating the Eternal Light Peace Monument up on Oak Hill at Gettysburg, so that's kind of in the background. And the words on it are, Peace Eternal in a United Nation. He closed by saying, all of them we honor, not asking under which flag they fought then, thankful that they stand together now under one Flag. So that's the same time that the cartoon came out in the Philadelphia newspaper of the two veterans together. And there were newsreels of these old, old men 
literally shaking hands across the wall, the famous stone wall at Gettysburg. So this is the very reconciliationist take uh, on the war. And the idea behind much of this is, and in the literature, is that they just that white veterans, for example, from the Union just completely turned their back on black veterans. Well, a more recent scholarship suggests that isn't true. You, could, you can be a racist and still be glad that emancipation came and think that ending slavery, we've talked about that a lot in this class. How you, when you talk about slavery and attitude, attitudes towards slavery and attitudes toward race, you need to understand that they can be somewhat puzzling to us now because we, what we would assume to be the case on their part often isn't the case. And that was often true with Union veterans looking back at the war. Your other two, the U.S. has commemorated the Civil War in a number of stamps. I put two examples uh, in your handouts. The first page, which has five of them on it, it was a simpler time uh, in the centennial years when, when I was young and everything, we only had to learn nine things and then you were considered educated. They only put five stamps out during the Civil War centennial, and there they are, one each year. Just imagine that. And it's very straightforward. They're battles. <laughs> they don't take a side. They don't, there's nothing political about them. It wouldn't take, the only argument would be, well, okay, we've got, should we have more in the West or more in the East? And of course, there are more in the East because, as we know, the East is more important, uh, even though other people are confused about that. We have Shiloh in the West. We have Gettysburg, the Wilderness, Appomattox in the east. That's about the right proportion, three to one, uh, to come out there. Your next sheet shows, shows how much more complicated, but that is, it's even-handed. There's no taking sides there. Fast forward to the 1990s. That is the sheet of commemorative stamps from the 90s, and you can see that it's completely different. It has men and women, black and white, Native American, different battles. It's a much more complicated landscape of the war, but still an even-handed one in terms of, for every Union figure, there's a Confederate figure. Uh, and, you, and, and if you look at the very top, and I didn't bring my glasses, but I'm pretty sure it says this. I think it says Civil War in very large letters, and then I think it says War Between the States in smaller letters. That's again who calls it the war between the states? Former Confederates. It should be war among the states, I think, but never mind that. <laughs> they call it war between the states, and the United States calls it the Civil War. Well, that's not really what many, what did Union people really call it? The War of the Rebellion. When they published all the records of the war, they didn't call them the war, the records of the state. It's the War of the Rebellion. That's what it is. But this strikes about Civil War is in bigger print, but... And I can just kind of close my eyes and imagine the table where they're all arguing about this. You've got to put war between the states in there. Well, I don't want to put war, but you've got to put it in there. Well, okay, put it smaller. Well, how much smaller? Well, I want it bigger. No, we better have it smaller. And you can just hear, in ahead in your lives are committee meetings. I weep uh, at that prospect. You're going to learn to hate committee meetings more than anything else in your life. Where you go in, you sit around for three hours, and then you decide to meet again. <laughs> And it really makes life seem not worth living uh, when you're in those. Okay, where are we today? Well, the Civil War still gets a lot of attention today. And I think people come at the war with two basic things in mind. And the first one is, what can we find in the war that is really about us? And things we're interested in now. How do we draw from the war things that will be pertinent to political or social issues uh, that we are involved in now. And of course, it's full of those kinds of things. Uh, it's bursting with them, in fact. Two obvious ones are things related to race. The current wave of debates about monuments came in the wake of the Charleston killings. I mean, that, it's not, it, that didn't just sort of happen to come that way. It came that way, revisiting these Confederate memorials in the wake of, of a brutal racial incident uh, in our current world. It brings the emancipation cause back into the picture. Uh, Hollywood has embraced that the, for years the lost cause was the default understanding of the war in Hollywood and the apogee of that is gone with the wind. But the emancipation cause is now the default understanding of the war. You, those of you who wrote about Lincoln, you see it in Lincoln. 
It's even in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Uh, that is, it's all through Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. This is a war. It's only about slavery and Gettysburg. It's perfect. Gettysburg ends the war in Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Don't mess with those other two years. It's all settled at Gettysburg and it's all about slavery. Any of you who suffered through the free state of Jones uh, know that that movie kind of presents this, this sort of biracial nirvana. Where? Where? In, uh, anyway, I won't go off on that. That is, it's wishful thinking and projection there. But the understanding is that the emancipation is the cause that has the most resonance among the ones that came to us from the wartime generation. There's also a good deal of debate about the relative power of the central and the local governments. I mean, we've seen this. Uh, Barack Obama is elected president. Texas talks about secession. Donald Trump is elected president. California talks about secession. I mean... Here's the deal. <laughs> Secession was settled by the Civil War. That is not going to happen, but you go back to the war. I just find it amazing that you have people who are, they must wake up and say, I know what I want to do. I want to get right with South Carolina in 1860. That's what I want, so I'm going to argue for secession. Uh, there must not be a mirror in the house where that happens, I think, and there is a little check uh, on themselves. So you can go back to the war finding ways to extract from it things that are pertinent to us. Now, the other way to go back is to go back and try to understand what was actually going on. And that often leads to problems because what we think should have been going on often isn't what was going on. I mean, to us, to people in 2017, a great war to end slavery makes sense. That is worth this profusion of blood to eradicate the institution of slavery from the American Republic. But when you go back and actually read stuff, which is dangerous, you find out that, alas, that is not the primary motivation. And you find out that you have to come to terms with union. And that's a hard sell now. It's hard to tell people what union meant. What did it mean? What did it mean? How could people, and part of that is that we've been a great power for all these decades. It's hard to imagine anything internally literally destroying the republic now. People don't wake up and wonder whether the nation is still going to be here next year. But that was a genuine fear in the mid-19th century, and it's tied to union. And recovering that can be very difficult, and it causes us to sort of get outside our current comfort zones and come to terms with the real past. It's not about picking people you, oh, I like them and I don't like them. I mean, that's inevitable. We do that. There are people we like more than other in the others in the past. But what the goal for this second way to get at the war should be is understanding what was going on in the past, not deciding whether you like uh, Robert Gould Shaw more than you like Jubal Early. Uh, it's understanding it. It's a very different process. Both of them will always go on, and both of them are great fun, actually. And it's, it's as a kind of detached observer, I like to sit back and watch the Civil War carnival unfold, as it always does, kind of in waves, uh, but it always does. Here's what I want. Here's, here's the main thing that I want, and I know this is going to happen, because some of you down the road, when you're much older, you know, mid-20s, uh, you're going to sit down in front of your computers, or probably, you probably text by then, and, uh, and admit to me that you've either been to a battlefield or read something that made you think about HIUS 3072. And if that happens, my heart will soar. I love to think that some of you, now many of you have, are going to be unscarred either, at least in that way, by this class. Some of you, as I've said before, I don't think more than a week's counseling, even for the worst cases here of the damage that we've done in 3072. But some of you are actually going to go out of here and stay in touch with the Civil War. And I consider that a spectacular success. And you owe me papers. You know when. I'm looking for them. Go write them. <laughs>